which humans are going to, th to be leveling up and which humans are going to be leveled off. If you have an SOP for anything, that can be automated intelligently, meaning that an AI, so AI, quote unquote, can do the job. And so if your stuff is legible and understandable and describable, then it can be done now. Like we, you don't have to wait for a model to become good enough. Like it can be done now. James Schramko here. Welcome back to my podcast. Today we're having a chat about AI and I've brought along Samuel or Sam Woods, uh, depends how you know him, to talk about that. G'day, Sam. How are you going? Pretty good. How are you? Good. Uh, you've been really leading the charge there with bionic marketing. <laughs> I want to give that a shout out because I don't really follow much these days, but I do follow you and you seem to be following the breadcrumbs of AI and, and I feel like it's really important. Yeah. I try to, I mean, it's impossible to keep up in general. Like there's so much coming out the past year or even past two years. So I do, I do what I can to keep up, but most of my experience is using AI and then building AI systems for companies. So I think through the use of it, you learn more than just reading, I think, the latest releases because there's an endless stream of releases all the time. I think you've sort of touched on my learning style, which is I guess the first part is to know what you don't know. And that's where I yeah. discover things through reading your newsletter. But I'm a real pragmatist as well. I'm working on experiments with my team. I'm using this stuff in the background. You say, hey, check out. Uh, you're like, I think you did a post like, why are you dicking around with all these silly tools instead of using <laughs> notebook LM? And then um, the previous episode we published was um, Google taking over my podcast and I'd, I'd fed it my book and had the podcast host read out the summary of it. And I had some really interesting responses to that. I actually expected people to um, almost be upset or think it's lame, but I had the opposite. I had people saying that was really cool but I got that breadcrumb from you and then I go and play with it and apply it. Now I've built out all sorts of notebooks and I'm sure it's going to come up in today's discussion because I'm going to ask you what people are using. I'd be crazy not to if you're building it for companies. In fact, that was one of my questions. We can talk to one of these um, these people out there, like normal people, not online marketer people, you know the type, like school parents uh, and we we talk about um, there's going to be change. Like Sam said, yeah. the next six months is going to change, right? They're like, yeah, oh, yeah well, I don't really see it now and uh, maybe it's overhyped. Uh, but then you say, no, no, can, you can actually take workflows and then have the computer start doing that and then it, it can do that. And they're like, well, where, where do we go to get that? Who does that? That's one of the big questions I get and that sounds like something you actually do. It might be something I that I can help steer people in the right direction. It's is one of those things that it's happening so fast uh, on the edges and the frontier of technology. And what most people don't realize yet is that you can actually replace a lot of jobs and tasks. And there will always be new jobs, right? Different jobs. But you can already have these systems or models do so much that the only reason it hasn't quite happened yet in maybe your industry or your market or your business is purely from a lack of knowing that it's possible. Like there's, I can, you can automate so much already. You can use different AI systems already that the only reason it's not, you know, in people's daily lives is just because people don't know. And um, I, it's, it's, it's bizarre for me to be in this because on the one hand, the work I do and the things that I see and the people I know who are actually doing like frontier research labs, like they tell me things and, um, sometimes I wonder, like, maybe I should just go buy a farm somewhere and just wait this out and just let it play <laughs> play out over the next couple of years, because it, it's 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 happening. It's it's here, and it's only a matter of time before it becomes something that is part of everything you do. Like, iPhones are soon going to have what they call Apple intelligence, right? And uh, so all these things is it's going to become like electricity, almost in a sense that it's just going to be a part of what you do in different ways. And the question is, you know, once it's a commodity, because that's where it's going real fast, then what do you do? If everyone has AI, then what makes your AI special, right? So it's it's going to make, I think it's going to level up a lot of businesses, not, every, not all businesses, but it's going to level up a bunch of them. And I think they'll become the winners in any given market. Well, I think there's some of, some of them will level up and some of them will be leveled. And <laughs> 
you know, like this, I'll, I'll tell a short story here because I feel like it's really relevant. My mentor used to make me watch the movie Patton over and over again. Yeah. And one of the great scenes in that movie was where uh, he defeats Rommel in a tank battle. And at the end of it, he holds up a book and it's Rommel's like guide to tank warfare. And he goes, Rommel, you fabulous bastard. Yeah. And the, the lesson there was if you want to win in the future, have a look at the history. Yeah. And sure. this, is, this is the important thing. Ten years ago on this podcast, I was talking to Justin Brooke and I mentioned that at the time AI uh, was able to identify different shapes and objects. Yeah. It did, didn't sound very threatening then. Six years ago, I had James Taylor on the show and he was talking about um, AI had put together his keynote presentation. Yeah. At the time, that was like, whoa. And he was using IBM's Watson. Yeah. And I, I've constantly had guests like Mike Rhodes talking about how the big players are using AI algorithms in the background to running yep. for running ad campaigns and placements and stuff. And like most online marketers know that. But that's a that's sort of at arm's length in a way. And then this year, gosh, the stuff we can do. I'm hearing about notebook and experiencing that. I have my own team who are not developers building apps in our business for things that we do for ourselves. And I, I like that Rick Rubin sort of idea of make stuff for yourself. I've always done yeah. that. Right? My first info product that I was successful with online was making it for me. Uh, all of the coaching I do, I'm helping people get strong in the areas that I had to go and learn with, with actual books. Um, but so history tells us that the change is happening. And I remember Mike Rhodes actually said it's going to happen slowly and then it'll happen really quickly. And I feel like we are in that hockey stick phase. And I've just noticed something about myself. I'm enthusiastically talking about this to my team and to basically anyone who will listen lately around me. And that, the last time that happened was when the internet came. Yeah. You know, I was talking to, right. to, to mums and dads at school games about, you know, you can build a, you can build a website and like you can put book reviews yeah. and, and link to Amazon <laughs> and get paid commission. And yeah, I, I, right. it was so exciting. <laughs> I feel like this is as important. And one thing I say to people when they're like, well, yeah, but how does it really affect me? I'm like, well, when you went to the supermarket, how did you check out? And they're like, oh, I just scanned my own stuff. I'm like, yeah, well, you see, like 15 years ago, there was someone standing there and they right. did. When I was a kid, people would come out to your car at the at the gas station and fill it up. I know that still happens in some places. That happens when I go to the Philippines. And I think it happens in some US places where it's illegal to, to fill your own car. But in Australia, there are no service staff. Like there'll be one guy in a whole petrol station and everyone's filling up their own cars. So it's obvious that companies are going to cut out the most uh, difficult part of it. I, I know apparently in um, is it Uber, the, the cheapest part is actually the human labor, but in, in a lot of other countries like Australia, labor costs are so high, it is a significant cost. I can see why people want to automate. But one of the obvious things is you can – uh, and this is what I like about websites, and this is why I think it's the same. If you can automate a workflow with the machine, you can get a consistently high output 24-7 yes. versus um, where you get with a human. And that kind of leads me to a few uh, really interesting discussion points, which is which humans are going to, th to be leveling up and which humans are going to be leveled off? How would you advise someone, especially um, university age kids and people in those sort of lower to middle tier jobs where they're not yet the expert, you know, like they talk about the K-shaped economy, that yeah. um, the top 80% you know, of what we know is useless and then the 20% is going to be more important than ever. What would you advise people who aren't yet aware of this, but, but want to get an epiphany on this podcast? Yeah, sure. I think uh, probably no matter what industry or business or market you're in across the board, what's going to be worthwhile for the next, I don't know, five years is to understand systems thinking, connecting dots and seeing the whole. And as technical as this may sound, you need to start thinking fractally, meaning that whatever happens on a low level scales up and happens on a high level. And I would, uh, I would understand the mechanics of what you do. And I would spend some time like truly understanding it. 
and working with it. So you have a grasp on what it's like to do this, the, the most menial tasks that are involved in your job or inside your business, just do them enough. So you understand how they work and then understand that that stuff, the more legible something is, the more easy you can automate it. And the more easily it'll be done by an AI system of some kind. So anything that's legible, explainable, that can be broken down into an SOP in two steps. If that's, if your job is purely repeating steps, then you're going to have a hard time. So what you need to do is at least understand it. Cause once you understand the pieces that go into your task, your job or your project, now you understand it from a systems perspective and you understand where things start, you understand the middle and where things end. And you need to have that view of what you do. Uh, it's almost like you're orchestrating tasks more than you are necessarily even delegating them. And being able to see the full picture, the systems view, the design thinking, where you take a few steps back and you see the whole and the parts and get out of the job that you may be pursuing. If your job is leading you down the path of repeating steps in an SOP, then you're going to be better off not pursuing that. And instead, you should move toward the higher order thinking and the higher order tasks, which for now, and we'll see how long this lasts. It'll last several years. But for now, you want to get almost beyond the, you want to get away from the labor part. You want to quickly move through the intelligence part of your job that requires you to think. And that's where you'll be in a good place for the next few years. But even beyond that, you need to start moving into more of what looks like wisdom work, which sounds esoteric, but the easiest way to explain that or to think about that is doing the right thing at the right time. And just because your business can solve a problem in one way, you need to start asking, does it make sense for us to solve it in this way? And maybe it makes sense for you to, for your business or your job to do things a certain way for a limited period of time, as long as you understand that everything has an expiration date and the half-life of your job or your business has shrunk where you could, um, for a while, your business could solve a problem or bring a solution or an outcome and you can operate, you can turn that into an SOP. You can, you know, it can become a mechanism of source where it's repeatable and scalable in that way. But I think in the next five or so years, that'll dramatically change to the point where scalability is not going to come from how quickly you can build a factory, but more come from how quickly you can simplify what you do and remove things from what you do because an AI system can end up doing most of it, right? So shift your thinking from the menial task focused approach and pursue the things that require you to have a certain tempo in decision-making to see things from a systems point of view understanding how to orchestrate for an outcome to happen as opposed to doing the job step by step. Does that make any sense? Makes a lot of sense. And I want to just recap that. And this is right in my wheelhouse. It's like, it's exactly what I'm a specialist at is, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, big picture thinking, pragmatic, but being able to understand systems. So I, I drew a lot from W. Edward Stemmings. Uh, I noticed say Elon Musk in the news yesterday uh, in NVIDIA, he installed like 100,000 NVIDIA cards in his factory in 19 <laughs> yeah. days and they said it normally yeah. takes four weeks. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the people who rise in, the, in a business are not going to come from sales or accounting. They're going to be engineers and designers. On a very practical small scale, I'll talk about my business for a second and I'm going to ask you how it's affected your um, conversion optimization and copywriting business. But in my team, we would, you know, in the past, like, 10 years ago, they'd listen to this podcast with headphones and transcribe it by hand. And then tools like Otter came along. And now everything like, you know, from Loom to Zoom or whatever are creating AI summaries and so forth. Yeah. So it's very clear the manual process stuff has gone. So I've been redeploying my team as the, the wisdom. Instead of being the worker transcribing the words, they are selecting the right tools to jockey them to find the leverage. And when you talk about fractal, that really excites me, you know, but based on my 64-4 philosophy, the 80-20 on the 80-20. Another way that I think of it is leverage. I've excited my team about this and said, all the roles you're doing are, are going to be replaced by AI, but you're going to be the ones driving the AI 
and we're just going to be creative in our ideas. And we've thought about what are the things that we're doing and the problems we're solving, but how can we really amp that up for our partners and for our own core businesses? And a, a lot of that comes around content curation, creation, research, propagation, distribution, and we're finding a lot of leverage in that. One thing that I think we've been actually quite good at is not getting distracted by all the the new stuff because there's thousands, I don't know, maybe tens of thousands of new things, but I'd say 90% of them will be obsolete in a year from now. And I'm thinking about the, in the online space, in your space, the copywriting space, there were some pretty popular tools three or four, maybe five years ago. And I felt like they were doomed because probably chat GPT can do all of the things they did if you apply frameworks and especially if you create your own GPTs. And I think we absolutely have to talk about that. So I want to ask you about how do we create a custom GPT if you're prepared to answer that, but also what changes have you seen in the copywriting and conversion scene? Because, uh, I mean, I've had Will Wang on the show a few times and we've been assessing, you know, is it at the point where it beats a human? And, and I think the last time we chatted about it, which was in fairness, probably at the, earlier in the year or last year, and at that time it was going to beat a rookie or an intermediate, but the very good experts could still create way better copy. So I wonder your reflection on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, most copywriters will not like me for saying this. And I don't, and it doesn't bring me joy to say this, right? I I started off as a copywriter way, you know, way back when. I'm not obviously that old and haven't been I've only been around in this space for at this point 12, 13 years. So it's not like I have a ton of time. But I started off as a copywriter, direct response and did all that stuff. And I love copywriting. But the reality is that either a sufficiently fine-tuned model or a model with the proper uh, prompt engineering and context and everything else can produce master level copy that looks and reads and sounds like a veteran senior copywriter who's been doing it for 30 years and the copy without with either minimal editing or no editing uh, will beat copy written by a human. Right, so we're we're there, and we have been there since last year. And it's only been a question of how much work do you want to put in to make that system, that AI copywriting system. And at this point, so last year it took work and you know elbow grease, and you had to really work work at it. At this point now, when we're recording this, it's been as easy as uploading documents and examples to any model, and then prompting them the right way, and then off you go. So. To me, which is as an online marketer, that has been my bread and butter, conversion rate optimization, copywriting, all that stuff, funnels, like you name it. uh, It brings me no joy to say that those jobs and those tasks can easily be done by an AI system at this point and for a while now, right? And I've seen that in higher level agencies. I've kind of touched upon my own way of thinking about this. It's like pick your model, uh, whether it's GPT or lately, Notebook's actually been fantastic for this particular application. Feed it with source material. Like, well, basically train it. Train the model and then apply a framework and then you get the output. It's been my, my rough system around it. And so mm-hmm. I did that when I published that podcast episode. I fed it my book <laughs> and then I trained it with a framework of outputs that I want from it and it was able to produce social media content, yeah. uh, all sorts of stuff. But the big difference, and this is really an important one, like a lot of artists are whinging about this. It's taken away uh, creativity, it's uh, theft of IP, blah, blah, blah. Well, in this case, I'm actually having it reformat my own stuff, my yeah, own right. my own stuff being yeah. – pushed and, and leveraged around into the different formats for different platforms and yeah. different modalities. I got no issue with that. And in fact, lately I take my stuff, apply frameworks and create a teleprompter output. And I put it right here on this screen that I'm looking at that no one else can see. And I can very quickly create content of my own stuff. But I, I've noticed uh, over the years, one of the huge differences as a podcaster is in the old days, I'd just flick on back in the day, it was Skype and just talk. Uh, But now you can do so much with your um, prompts and frameworks. Research and frameworks is absolutely the number Mm -hmm. one needle mover for me. Doing research, 
like right now I've done research on you and our podcast framework and I can see it in front of the camera and I think of it and I think maybe I got this from your newsletter. I think of AI as a pretty intelligent assistant. And I actually had someone in my team a few years ago used to go out and research the guest and put together some pre-show notes, but now I can do it in seconds Mm -hmm. and it's really sped things up. But one thing I was uh, one thing I was messing around with just a few weeks ago. I was sitting on my couch on a Sunday. I was with my phone and I was talking to GPT, which you can do now. Yeah. And I said, "Are you at the point where you can create custom apps for me?" And it said, "Oh yes. What would you like?" And I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> here we go." <laughs> and I started telling it what I want. And I said, "What questions do you have?" And that's a really important one. It says, "What language do you want to use? You know, do you want to use this platform or go custom?" And like it's. And I'm like, okay, so I'm just choosing. And then I got all the output scripts and then I gave it to the team to install on our server and it works. Yeah. And it's like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, it had some depreciated code and a few bits and pieces, right? I think there's still a small barrier between a member of the public having their own apps today. However, I think I'm anticipating we're not far off it saying, hey, I've noticed all the things you've been asking me. You know, do you know who I can make that do it for you? And I'll just say, yeah, okay. And then it'll probably do it. I think we're pretty close to that. Yeah, I, I would say we're at most from that being publicly available in a in a functional way. We're probably only a few months away from that. And so we're getting to the point where, and I'm I'm going to get back to your GPT question, but yeah. we're, we're getting quickly getting to the point where um, a person, uh, an ordinary person on the street or in a business you'll be able to just ask for software that you need to have stuff done. And I don't think SaaS will go away, but I do think that SaaS will change because why should I bother paying for SaaS tool that a ChatGPT or Claude or some other model can just make for me and it runs without really paying for it? Like you can pay for hosting and some some compute, right? But the, like the costs are, are not going to be as big as a usual SaaS description, right? So... You can essentially have on the fly, custom made, uh, temporary software built for you for the task at hand. Yeah. And you don't like, you'll get to the point where you don't need to know any code of any kind. You just describe what you want the app to do and then it'll do it for you. So in this way, like it's, it's not so much that jobs will go away or technology will go away. It'll change, but for the most part, it'll just be sidestepped, right? Like there's no... If I can have uh, ChatGPT on my phone make me custom apps on the fly for things that I need done, I'm just not going to bother buying software. And it's not that no one else will buy someone else's software, but I'm not going to buy software. Like, why would I if I can just have it done for me? It comes back to that thing of knowing what to ask for. For example, yeah. yep. last year when I was eating too much, I used uh, my fitness pal. This year, my uh, nutritionist slash um, metabolic expert friend Zach Mason. He said, "Well, you know, you can just build. You can just ask Chat GPT. You know, tell it all the meals you have, have it estimate the calories, and give it your budget. And and it can coach you. It could be a nutrition coach uh, or calorie coach. So it can really replace the function of what some of those software tools can do. And on that, I've been creating custom GPT threads in my GTP desktop app and my phone app." But there's a few options and I wanted to ask you about that. One option is you can tick the box to say, don't use this information to train AI. All right. Should we be ticking that box? If what you put in is highly proprietary, then you should tick that box to not have it train on it. That's but for me, it's a yes to both of those. So like yeah. <laughs> I'm putting in some of my proprietary stuff that I've been developing in spreadsheets for years. And I've, I'm like, oh my God, we're at this point now. So I've ticked <laughs> that box and I feel better about it. Like I've, being able to create some very specialized things. What I'm still training it, but at the point where I felt felt that it's perfect and I want to turn that into its own GPT, is that like one of the easiest software apps people could make at this point? Probably, but the the negative side of of a GPT that is made by like ChatGPT and so on is that if you give me the link to it and I use it within less than 30 seconds, I can reverse engineer it and have it give me everything you've given it. Right. So your IP is not protected at all. So like is, I, if you make it a GPT, is it automatically public? 
not automatically. No, you have to. Uh, I think you have to like set it to be automatic. You may, you have to make that choice. To so this it. is a really a big a big choice, and I'm having this conversation a lot. Most of my clients that I'm mentoring are building these in their back office, and I encourage them to keep it as a black box. Yes, I'm like, do absolutely. not do not share this tool, and don't tell people it exists. Like I've got tools that exist that I will not talk about on this podcast, I mean, you know, I'm a generous guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> but there is a limit. I'm, yeah. I'm not, I would not, for example, I would not make a public link to something like my own brain, right? My second <laughs> brain of, of my deepest treasured IP. And there's yeah. still some IP I have not tipped into the machine yet because I'm not comfortable about that yet. But for what I have been able to build, I'm really happy with the outputs it does. But I wouldn't share it. But if there is one that, let's say I wanted to go the other way and I want to create a tool for my audience. Let's say I've got a podcast audience and I wanted to create a tool that helps them uh, come up with video hooks or something like, you know, something. Let's just take a pedestrian example. How do I make a shareable GPT? The GPT is what OpenAI and ChatGPT calls their limited custom bots, is the way to think about it. Claude. Uh, Claude.ai, which is Anthropic, is behind that model. They call it projects. And then if you use something like Poe.com, which is more of like um, you have, you can have access to like 50 models inside Poe, and they call their thing bots. So they're all the same thing, which is a, it's just a limited system where it allows you to set a system prompt and then upload knowledge files, data, context, and then have it be specifically purpose built for whatever it is you want it to do. And I think at this point right now, as we're talking, I think Poe.com and their bots, which is the same as G a GPT or the same as a project, I think they have the best, uh, from using it, I think they have the best way to share a bot for someone else to use. And I do believe they do a pretty good job of protecting it so that people can't just reverse engineer it. And I do think they even allow monetization, like if you wanted to sell access to it or something like that. So my recommendation is for you to use Poe.com for something like that, because it's they have the best functionality. And I would like what you said just a few minutes ago, which is you, some people you'll say, like, keep it as a black box. Don't tell anyone you have it. It's just an internal thing. I think what people need to do is uh, right now in the quote unquote age of AI, if you have something proprietary or even something you suspect might be proprietary, just stop talking about it publicly or any like emails, podcasts, like don't talk about it at all. Don't even say, I have a thing that can do this. Just be quiet. You need to normalize having secrets. It's very hard for those, for the flex <laughs> culture to do that. Yeah, it is. Right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I've, I've, for the most part, like, even in my own case, like I ran memberships since 2009, but I didn't really talk about it for another 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I still, to this day, I've never taught anyone how to coach the way I coach. Still not taught that, right? I, I do feel there is um, absolutely real value in proprietary IP. And there's certainly many things that I do that I never talk about. And even to the extent where I don't post on social media, Cars, houses, family, all that stuff completely don't because I feel like um, some people have just, they have no filter and I, I feel like they think life has to be lived on social media. But really you're going to attract the wrong people, whether it's an enemy, a, a thief, a tax person, uh, a competitor. I mean my daughter borrowed a book from the library the other day and it was about um, Billy B. Brown and, and she had this exchange student who started copying her, every, you know, copying what she wears. And uh, this is a business lesson I hear every week in yeah. uh, like copycats are rife. Now yeah. I'm going to ask you a question that I get asked all the time. People like, James, where do you learn from? Because they're trying to vertically integrate me. Right. And I say, oh, well, yeah. I, I learn about AI from Samuel. Right. So I was like, just subscribe to bionicmarketing.io and you'll get all the breadcrumbs that I'm getting. Right. Sam Woods is yeah, the guy. Right. But where does Sam Woods learn about AI? I, uh, I have different sources. The most important source is from using it every day, every week for several years now. Right. So I got started with machine learning in 2016 when in a conversion rate of my stage in context, which at the time, having a machine learning model for predictive analytics and everything else, like that was the game to do if you were doing CRO. 
And so machine learning eventually turned into or spawned off what we call now generative AI. So ChatGPT or GPT-2 came out in, I think, 2019. And I was fortunate enough to have beta early access to GPT-3 in 2020. So I've been using these tools and I've been building tools and systems. So most of what I learn or figure out or like come across is from actually doing AI, right? Like actually using these systems and building them. And that's probably the best source because as you're building things, you come across alpha, which in investing is just an outside return versus the index. And a business context is having an unfair advantage. And so that's the most important one. I also spend time reading research papers, obscure ones that come out and just keep my finger on the pulse of what's going on in frontier labs. I've made friends in the industry and networking of people who work at Anthropic, OpenAI, Microsoft, all these huge labs and so on. I have friends who work there and every now and then they'll tell me something in a breadcrumb kind of way. And then I start picking at the breadcrumb and I get places. So I, I think it's, you know, if you're, unless you're touching it, uh, you will always get secondhand information. And that'll get you so far, but it won't get you far enough. And so the alpha that I've come across and that I've worked with, like there are projects I've been doing for a few years now that I will probably not talk about until maybe 10 years from now, because the potency of it is too big to just tell anyone about it. Yeah. Um, and it's not because I'm in any particular special place. Like there are thousands of people who do what I do, probably hundreds of thousands at this point. And everyone is... Like you talk to people and they, they tell you things in an indirect way, but everyone knows that you got to put a lid on it at some point because you start saying too much and you start giving away alpha or you start giving away an opportunity that you may as well take advantage of as opposed to just telling the world about it. So I touch things. It's I, like the opposite I, of a biz op speaker. Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. <laughs> they say it's ninety nine percent of their effort talking about the thing that they're selling yeah. everyone on doing, but they don't even do themselves. Yeah, and it stopped working probably like a few years ago, and they're just repeating it, right? So it's one of the greatest the clues I ever had was working at Mercedes Benz. Yeah, my most successful clients, STFU, right? <laughs> they were they were lid on it, black box. They would not. Yep. In fact, so many times, I'm, this is not this is not an unusual event. They would buy a very nice car, like I'm talking an SL65, mm. but they wouldn't drive it to their workplace. They'd just keep it for yeah. private, you know, for their other place down on the beach house or the uh, hinterland property or whatever. And like it wasn't part of the public thing. There was one client I had who's a billionaire, and he was test driving a Ferrari one day in a um, news reporter, one of those social pages reporters, saw him driving in it and wrote about it. And he was just just having a drive to see if he liked it or whatever. But after they published it, he's like, fuck it, I might as well buy it now because everyone thinks I've got one. <laughs> so, so it could work the other way. Um, yeah. <laughs> but in any case, I think I get what you're saying and I'm on the same page and it takes discipline to do that. It actually... Initially, for me, it took a lot of discipline not to share and talk about things because like, I'm a natural communicator in a way. I like I love to share ideas and stuff, and I float out uh, plenty of of good intel freely. Yeah. But yeah. I have a, a a pretty strong cone of silence with the people I work with, and I just cannot I cannot share some of the things that I know or, or hear about, and that's actually what makes me valuable to them but it's also right. intensely valuable to me and i'm fortunate to be in that privileged position but i celebrate i do see some of the things that people publicly share uh like for example what sean vossler's been doing with his machine you know to create incredible outputs from very complicated algorithms it's they give some clues as to what yeah. types of things but then i know i know for a fact people are applying that in other markets like financial markets, yep. um, building markets, like there's so much that can be done. And I, I reckon the huge takeaway so far, if I'm going to recap where we're up to is, one, you have to know that this thing is even a possibility. And then two, you've got to roll up the sleeves and get a bit dirty with it. And for me, it was observing my own user habits. 
starting to migrate some of my searches from Google to chat GPT was a big observation. Then when I'm starting to create floor plans for property developments and speeches for uh, birthdays and stuff, I'm like, oh, wow, I'm really getting more creative with this. And then I'm starting to build apps and I'm like, there really is no limit to it as long as you have the creativity to either think about it or uh, as I've always done in, in business and a commitment I made when I quit my job was I will research and develop. I will always commit time to thinking about surely there's somebody out there in the world way further down the track than I am. What could they possibly be doing? And and another exercise I do is I think I go back 10 years. If I knew 10 years ago what's available now, you know, like how would I have repositioned or done things. It's like the, you know, back to the future, going and buying, you know, betting on horse races or whatever. Yeah. What is likely to happen in the future that I would bet on and start moving? And that's what I've always done. And that's why my spidey senses are tingling because this feels to me as important as the internet. And I still remember my, my boss at the time, he's like, why would we put our website on our number plate frames? I'm like, because I feel like it's going to be important at some point. People, <laughs> yeah, yeah. people are going to go to the computer instead of into the dealership. Like they get the same emotional stress as going to the dentist when they walk into a showroom. They're going to want to just look online. Like that's that's going to happen. And even when I quit my job, he still didn't even understand what it was I was actually doing because it was still quite new in Australia. So what you're essentially what you're doing is that you are a keen observer and um sensor of what how humans function and like what is appealing to a human right so you're you're tapped into the humanity of existence and like you said like people have the same amount of stress as going to a dentist right and most people don't think of those terms and then i think what was happening and not to say this is like i'm not gonna try to profile you here or anything like that but i think what was happening is that you had for whatever your upbringing was like and your learning curve was like and where you were in, in the context of business and life you essentially had a pretty good discernment about what was going on, right? And so there are six or seven, I think, key skills that you have to double down on over the next few years. And every time I talk about these things, people's eyes glaze over because I'm not telling them how to put in a dollar into the Facebook slot machine and get $10 back, right? But I think these, the six or seven skills that I want, I want to tell you about, I think they matter more than anything else because they will lead to things that you just said right there, that this, the tingling spidey senses, the discernments, the insights, the little hunches that you go, I think this is happening. And you turn out to be right. And the first thing I will say is you have to develop a point of view. So perspective, you have to develop discernment, which is situational or contextual awareness. You have to develop judgment, which is decision-making. You have to develop your sense of taste and become the taste maker in your market. You have to develop your ability to articulate, which is expression. You have to develop your ability to select, which is curation. And all those things together, when done in a, in a situation, becomes wisdom, which is doing the right thing at the right time. Right. So your wisdom in that situation was we need to put our URL like so where people can see it. We need to have a website because like this is the right thing to do at, at the right time, even if you were early. Right. Same thing with AI right now. There's I in any given week because of the work I do and the people I talk to and things that I research every day. I'm, I'm, I'm coming across things and I go, holy cow, I could just double down on this single thing and probably build a 10 or $20 million company pretty easily. And I, and it doesn't mean that every idea is going to turn out that way, but there's so much potential in what's happening right now. It's the, it's truly a wild west moment. I think you said this, you could be the one person billionaire at some point. Yeah, you can be a one person, $1 billion company. That's entirely possible. Like that's within poss uh, now. That's a possibility because of agentic systems and uh, intelligence systems and so on. And who knows if someone will hit it? But it's possible. Like it, you maybe you could have pulled it off ten years ago, but it would have been really hard. Um, now, like all of a sudden, that's possible. I mean, I'm just I'm so excited about it because I am a leverage like yeah. addict. I love leverage, and all of the things you mentioned is so critical. You know. It's fascinating to me because 
this just points out one of the huge distinctions and and I think this could be a favor for someone if they're listening to this and and they feel af- afflicted by it. One thing that I've focused a lot on, not in the very early days, not in 2009, when I, uh, my first year out, I was doing workshops where bring along your laptop, we're going to build a website. And, you know, a day later they had their own website, right? We'd, we'd research, we'd write copy, we'd publish to the web, like, like, oh, like 120 people with their own website after a day. But they're still obsessed with this and it's not the right thing to obsess with. They're all obsessed with how. Oh uh, yeah, and you know, sure. there's way better things to focus on. Right? Obviously, Dean Jackson, my friend, is talking about who, not how. So that network is important. Like you're a who in my world. Who do we find out about? Just talk, just follow this guy. We need to know why. I want. I want to understand why is this happening. I want to understand what could possibly happen. What are the things that are even possible? Who do we go to? And when are these things going to happen? You, I've definitely been too early to the market before. When I came online in 2005, 2006, um, properly, like I first used the internet in 95 and 96, <laughs> it was a bit slow then. That was when I understood that the, the car industry is doomed because the only reason, and again, you know, make your own stuff. I was going online to find out about new models coming in BMW, which where I worked at the time before they got published in the magazines. The dealership is the last people they're going to tell about new stuff. But I had customers coming in saying, I want this new model. I'm like, what model? And they could yeah. bring me like this printout from Mosaic or whatever it was back then. Uh, and yeah. Lycos and all these things, search, ask Jeeves. And I'm like, okay, this is really important. And at the same time, my family's travel industry, like people started to do their own bookings uh, and cut them out. I'm like, okay, I, this internet, this is a thing. I need to learn how to build a website. And, and I went for it. But I, I've switched from teaching people how to do stuff so much as going for the more macro stuff. But you know that prompt people uh, circulate in the moment to, to GPT, like what are things that I may not know about myself based on all the prompts, that question? Yeah. Um, everything it told me I already knew. <laughs> yeah. It's a, but, it's a cold reader. It's not and, – and not to interrupt you, but people have to understand – if you were part of the training data, then maybe ChatGPT, so to speak, knows. It doesn't technically know, but it knows. But you have to understand what it's doing is like is telling you a horoscope. It's not actually telling you anything about you. It's doing a cold read on you. 100%. And so like it's not telling you anything factual usually. It's just telling you things you want to hear, like a horoscope. Exactly. I mean, and I mean, I agreed with what it said, but I also don't yeah. believe in horoscopes or most of those <laughs> yeah. profiling tools, right? So I'm like a huge skeptic. Yeah. Based on what you just said, I, I feel like it's just going to work on your own confirmation bias and the, yes. the data that you put in it. They just parrot it back. I mean, it's, a, it's actually an ages old sales technique, isn't it? Mirroring yeah, it is. uh, reflection. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You don't have to do that yeah. much work once you know the, the technique. Uh, yeah. I mean, who hasn't watched all those awesome hypnotist videos online and Darren Brown and all that to see the power of it? So, Let's just sort of tie this up with a nice little little bow. For you, um, because let's say you're uh, an AI commentator at the moment in the position you're in right now in this podcast, a lot of the people listening to this are aware that AI is here. They might have been in the overhyped basket, but I'd say most of my audience are in the less than overhyped basket. They're in the mid- middle hype basket because I'm a middle hype guy, right? I'm, I'm not... <laughs> yeah. I'm not the first guy to get everything and then tell everyone about it and then it falls off a cliff. I'm pretty conservative. I have to be careful with recommendations. And if I'm putting myself out there saying, I think this AI is important, then now it's time to get serious about it in my mind. And I think people who pay attention to this episode could have a vastly different life in a few years from now than if they went down the course of not listening to this episode. That's the outcome I want. What do you think the key inputs will be that would cause that? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the the easiest place to start, the simplest way to start is if you have, and I'll, I'll go really granular, if you have an SOP for anything, that can be automated intelligently. Meaning that an AI, so AI, quote unquote, can do the job. And so if your stuff is legible and understandable and describable, then it can be done now. Like we, you don't have to wait for a model to become good enough. Like it can be done now. And so 
if you're not, if you're, <laughs> if you haven't tried to automate a task in your business yet with AI, then like now is the time to try it. If you haven't tried to replace, even replacing Google with perplexity.ai or Claude or ChatGPT, like if you haven't done it yet, then you need to start using it in ways for the simple things, the low hanging fruit in your life, just to have it write an email for you or whatever. And I get it, like people go, oh, it'll ne never ha have my tone. Like, yeah, not yet. But if you give it an example of, of an email that you've written, it can mimic your tone excellently. And so I think you got to start touching it, so to speak. You have to start using it. And if you are, then the next thing to do is just start having agents start doing tasks for you inside your business. And once you've done that and have... Um, like there are marketing team, I, some companies that I've worked with that are large, like we're talking fortune 100 and fortune, like 500 companies. Some of the marketing teams used to be like 20 people. And it brings me no joy to say this, but now it's basically three people managing agents doing the same work as 20 people used to do. Like it's not, and I, and I see this in micro businesses even more so. Yeah. And you know, yeah. there's a, there's a large publicly listed company in Australia whose budget for AI per year is $20 million. <laughs> right. Like you can't tell me this isn't going to be a thing. Yeah. There's no way these companies wouldn't. Would, and, and now the CEO of that company can ask the custom tools they've built anything and it will answer it instantly. Like, yes. So that's why I think the middle layer is in trouble. You've got, yes. I like your wisdom, get wisdom yeah. Uh, is such a big output. And and I think from my perspective, like something I've always done is it's okay to tinker and not feel guilty about it. In fact, I yeah. really strongly encourage you to just play with this stuff. And and like almost everything useful at the very first phases, you don't get much progress and it feels like hard work and it's easy to give up, whether it's surfing, <laughs> trust me on that one, <laughs> um, AI or like for me building a website, I think I struggled for nine months to even get a page live. Like I was hopeless at it, but it's turned into being a good idea for me to go online. So, <laughs> so <laughs> uh, have some R and D time, get wise, take an SOP and turn it into a, an automated process. In my case, I've made the choice with my five team members to involve them in this and say, let's do this together and let's be creative on mass and let's let's get a hive community and, and they're, they're coming at me with amazing stuff that I, I didn't ask them for like they take images and turn them into videos and all that sort of stuff and and I, I love it we'll, we'll do this together and we can afford to thankfully so this is the time Sam Woods you have been very generous um, bionicmarketing.io uh, newsletter is a good place to subscribe to um, tell Sam you heard him on the podcast and uh, and thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It's, lo it's lovely to meet you and Likewise. Um, for you to put aside the time for this chat. Well, thanks for having me on, James. It's really a pleasure and a privilege. I've been listening to your stuff for years, as I mentioned in a, in a message to you. So I'm really grateful that you had me on. And th the best thing I can say is, like you said, just start using it, start touching it, start doing things with it. There is no other way than through, right? Like there's no there's no shortcut. Like you got to drop the shortcut mentality on this. You got to get your hands dirty and it'll pay off like huge. Big time. Thank you. Uh, alpha. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sam. You got it. This is James Schramko.